thank you very much for this opportunity to chair this discussion. I think that uh, one of the, um, the many unpleasant side effects of the Ukraine war, but one of them is that the much higher profile of nuclear issues uh, following this. Uh, there's the direct concern that Russia might, at some point in this conflict, uh, use a tactical nuclear weapon, which is openly debated in the press and debated in private uh, by Western and other policymakers. And then there's also the fear that one consequence of this conflict, as people think through the lessons, is that we'll get a surge in nuclear proliferation, that people will conclude that the mistake that Ukraine made was to give up its nuclear weapons in the 1990s, uh, and that the only protection against being invaded by a nuclear power or any other power is to have a nuke. Uh, and that therefore the whole nuclear non-proliferation regime is gonna break down. And I know both our speakers today have thought very hard about this, uh, have some innovative ideas about um, how to combat these dangers. So let me start uh, by, by calling upon them. Uh, let's go to Tokyo first and Professor Iwama. Uh, I can't see you on my screen, but I'm assuming you're there. Um, <laughs> so so uh, if you could tell me, just before we get to your, your, your proposals for how to deal with this, um, just give me an idea of the atmosphere in, in Japan. I mean, how heightened is the debate around nuclear issues now as a result of this war? Well, um, there's, a, there's a sudden burst of interest in, in nuclear weapons in general. And, and, and precisely because of the reason that you just named, uh, that uh, people assume that it was because that the Ukraine gave up the nuclear weapons, uh, in early 90s that it is now being invaded by uh, Russia. But even preceding that, I think there was a already um, sort of a building up of tension here because of Chinese uh, uh, missiles and nuclear capabilities and, and also because of the North Korean tests that's been yeah. going on at a, at a and very intensive uh, pace uh, recently, uh, to say the least. So um, there's been growing interest, but certainly this Ukraine crisis has really um, just pushed us into a totally new era. Um, it just, you know, I do Twitter and I used to only have like hundreds of followers and now it's, it's, gone, on a, it's gone into the thousands and now it's the tens of thousands. And I don't, I don't personally think I'm, an entertaining person, <laughs> but um, that just shows that people are really looking and searching for information, which has been very scarce actually in Japan, because yeah. we have this long tradition of just saying we don't want nuclear weapons, we don't, you know, nuclear weapons are wrong, they should be annihilated, uh, we don't want to do anything about it. So this long tradition of hush hush about the nuclear weapons, and suddenly we're sort of jumping into the direct opposite, where we have a very vocal um, part of the society advocating for anything, whatever, to do with nuclear weapons, because they're so, um, they're so full of anxiety about the situation, and they don't know much about nuclear weapons, and therefore they just uh, want to get information from anywhere, uh, anybody. And, and there's this funny idea that popped up is, um, the shortest way of getting information is nuclear sharing. And so this, um, you would pick up um, And uh, by nuclear, sh nuclear sharing, explain for the audience what that means. Um, well, maybe um, William's better <laughs> at that than me. Um, he's been at NATO. But uh, I mean, the current nuclear sharing is uh, um, that Americans provide the bombs and uh, the allies, Germany, um, Dutch, and several other countries, Italians, provide um, dual, the so-called dual-capable aircraft, which are fighter jets, like tornadoes, um, F-35, F-16. And, but the nuclear warheads remain in American hands until the very last minute. Mm -hmm. um, and this is very important because the ownership is totally American. You, you hear the word sharing, and, and many Japanese also assume that this is real sharing, but it's not. <laughs> and I really try to emphasize this. This is not really sharing of nuclear weapons as such. It's sort of a sharing of uh, 
of the responsibility of conducting nuclear war, I guess. Um, so once the war starts, you're in it together. But before that, the nuclear weapon is entirely American and you have this aircraft. And when the war starts, um, you put the, the nuclear bombs, uh, B-61s at the, the moment. You, well, historically, there were many, many variants, but essentially... What's the attraction yeah, for both sides of that? So presumably for the country that does the nuclear sharing, you're under the American nuclear umbrella at that point. But for, and for the Americans, because it, it, it ties their allies closer into, into them, means that they will fight alongside them? Is, is that the basic thinking? Well, it's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> I would ask for William's help to, to put okay, that Okay, well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll ask William about it as well. But, uh, but yeah, okay. But well, just... uh, well, essentially, yeah. it's, it's uh, sharing the inform uh, information concerning nuclear weapons, right? Mm -hmm. You want to know when and how the nuclear weapons will be used as an ally. Right. And, and then uh, in NATO, ever since the late 50s, there was this long story, um, history of soul searching and searching for methods, how to sort of trust each other that nuclear weapons will be used when and where it is need, but only when it is needed and not just uh, you know american things well folks it's the it's the time now let's go you know <laughs> you, you need to sort of <laughs> um, that's i mean and that's the picture so the americans are the really the dominant player here when it comes to nuclear weapons you have the the brits and the french but they're much much smaller and so mainly it's the americans who has the nuclear weapons mm. and the the allies and that includes Japan, are told to trust the nuclear umbrella, but naturally they're not that confident. And, and before, so... I, before I come to your specific proposal, um, hmm. just give me, can you give us a sense of where the debate, I mean, you described the contours of the debate in Japan. Do you get a sense of its direction? I mean, do you think that the idea that was once unthinkable, that Japan would have nuclear weapons or do nuclear sharing, is now becoming mainstream, or is it just a debate that's opened up? Um, it's it's just a debate that's opened up, but it's it's. Uh, I mean, like one year ago, it was really really marginal. You could only name um, several people who would um, say such things. Now, I think you can count um, 10, 20 politicians who who kind of um, share interest and think it's important that, that Japan has some sort of say in the nuclear operation. And are they tend, do they tend to be on the nationalist right or is it across the yes, spectrum? Yes, definitely, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah, I would guess. So you've been thinking, you know, as you, you rather modestly said, you're suddenly getting all these thousands of Twitter followers because uh, even though you're not that interesting, but that's not the case because obviously you're one of Japan's leading thinkers on these issues and you, you're trying to advance the debate. So um, give us an idea of, of the proposal that, that you're coming up with and I think I think you may even have a slide okay. that helps us with it right so um, I have you know what I've been doing um, in the past 10 20 years is as I've been very quietly studying NATO history and and that's all because I was uh, at uh, West Berlin as a student um, at the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall. You know, it's funny, I know several um, female scholars who were there at the time, uh, like Hope M. Harrison and uh, Mary Sarote, who is now really sort of active in this field, and they have all the roots in um, 9th of November 1989. But leave that um, um, aside. So I've been studying NATO history, and I've been sort of, I lived through how the Germans came out of this era where they had thousands of nuclear weapons around them to a relatively quiet and peaceful um, circumstance that they are now. And now I think there's a real danger that, that you are sort of going to wind the clock back into some point where you had sort of nuclear weapons on both sides, almost equal in numbers. So, so my point is that we have to learn lessons from European history. Japanese people tend to think that um, Europeans did, did everything right because they won the Cold War. And I don't agree because I sat down and studied history a lot. 
I think they did a lot of things, not wrong, but they could have done a lot of things better. And therefore, I want Asia to do things better. And now because of Ukraine, it's, it's just uh, the entire world that has to learn lessons and do things better. So what I'm proposing, there, there are two things that's on slide. One is the global double truck proposal, where I'm sort of saying this is a sort of a version two of NATO double truck decision 1979, uh, but non-nuclear. Because at that time, it was the Soviet assistant 20s, and there was a huge gap. Now it's the Chinese and, and, and partly Russian um, missiles, and there's really nothing on the NATO Japan Japanese side, uh, the middle range ones. So there's a huge gap which needs to be filled. And at that time, it was the decision to fill it with the uh, intermediate range missiles, nuclear, um, Persing 2 and uh, GCLM. And this was a huge thing in Germany, if you know anything, and I'm sure Gideon, you remember those days. Um, no, just so, about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what we want to do now is an offer of global disarmament, just as they did in 1979, which um, eventually Gorbachev picked up, Gorbachev and Reagan picked up. So, at the moment, I see no, no prospect of either Putin or Xi Jinping picking our proposal up. But I still um, think it's really important that we start with disarmament office. And I see the, the timing um, um, ideal this year because you have the German G7 uh, chairmanship and the next year is Japanese G7 chairmanship. And you have two gentlemen who are rather passionate about nuclear disarmament. One is Prime Minister Kishida, who comes from Hiroshima, and then the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, who happens to be in Tokyo tomorrow, <laughs> um, mm. is also quite dedicated. I mean, you know, he's lived his entire life um, chasing Brent's uh, backs, right? Mm. And this was his entire life um, trying to make uh, Europe whole and free of nuclear weapons. And now it's kind of in danger of. Uh, everything falling apart. So I think they share a passion there for sustaining the momentum of disarmament. But at the same time, we have to be able to deter either Russian, North Korean or Chinese aggression, the way that happened in Ukraine. And I think for that, we need a huge um, strengthening of missiles, conventional ones, on our side to tell the other side that we will be ready. Um, I mean, there are a lot of things we need to do, but for from seeing from Japan's point of view, step one is the mid-range nuclear, um, not nuclear, non-nuclear missiles, because that is entirely lacking in, in Japan when you sit right in front of the Chinese who have like 1,000 lined up and Americans and Japanese have none. The longest we have is 200 kilometers. Americans have none at all. I don't like the idea of bringing back nuclear intermediate range missiles, Americans one, into Okinawa. That would create a huge political problem. And therefore, we have to make our own to be able to deal with local crisis. I'm not talking about global nuclear war. I'm talking about very local crisis that will happen around our islands. But now there's a need on the American, uh, sorry, European front to strengthen their um, deterrence and defense. So I would uh, like to ask uh, William afterwards what he thinks is the right way forward. So yeah. that's one part of my proposal. The other is how to institutionalize it. And there um, comes in NATO. And NATO has been sort of strengthening um, partnership with the allies like Japan, Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. Now, I heard yesterday that uh, we are invited to NATO summit, Madrid. So my proposal will be something like uh, establishment of NATO Indo-Pacific Cooperation Council. I named it NICC after the NICC we had a long time ago, but the name is irrelevant, whatever you want to call it. I think we should inst institutionalize our discussions and we really need to sit down and count our assets, right? Our capabilities. Think what is lacking 
and also think about sort of bringing things around. And um, can you show us the next slide, please? I counted the Aegis ships, and there aren't much. <laughs> um, most of them are Americans, but um, Japanese has um, eight Aegis BMD capable ships, and on the European side, zero. Um, and there are several Aegis ships that are non BMD capable, and then there's uh, several Aegis ashore capabilities in Romania and Poland. So I think there's a lot that can be done here. And I also noticed that you know ships can be moved around. So American capabilities, Japanese capabilities, whatever capabilities that's coming up, the Korean ones, Australian ones, that can be moved around. You know, we could go to Black Sea, we could go to Baltic Sea. Um, if the UK develops their own capabilities, they can come around to South China Sea or to Japan Sea, wherever it's needed. So um, that's just one idea, uh, but I think we need to count the capabilities of missile defense, the missiles, um, cyber information, just sit down, look at the, uh, you know, the, the chart, count them and say, you know, what do we need and how do we combine our resources and how can we best sort of uh, um, make the capability um, interoperable and whole? Because we don't have much money, we don't have enough men, but for all of us, it's a huge trouble. So we have to make the best of what we have. Okay, I'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much indeed. That was, that was great. Um, so let, let me bring William in now. Um, I'll ask you in a second to, uh, to discuss the very interesting proposals that uh, Yoko has made in, in, in detail. But uh, let's start with more of a kind of general view. So William, I mean, uh, we talked uh, just now about the specific impact on the nuclear debate in Japan, but do you think that generally the whole global debate about nuclear proliferation and uh, the acquisition of nuclear weapons is now entering a much more active um, phase and that a lot of people are talking, having similar debates? Yes, I think, you know, we had a period after the end of the Cold War where, where it looked like cooperative security was going to be the name of the game, that the UN Security Council would be able to fulfill its obligations, and that there were what they used to call nuclear bargains to be had. And I think really the past 20 years or so has been stripping away a lot of those illusions and the realization that uh, great power competition is back and likely here to stay. And that, in fact, um, China and Russia and, and North Korea and maybe Iran have been using the opportunities of the West seeking arms control to actually engage in a pretty large military buildup. Um, obviously, Yoko mentioned China uh, and North Korea, but in Russia, we've had a huge escalation in terms of nuclear threats and rhetoric. Uh, you know, since the start of the Iraq war, Russia has put a tremendous amount of money into their nuclear arsenal. And rather than building, you know, sort of um, a triad, a triad that would look like, um, you know, minimum credible deterrence, the kinds of things that the West was going for in terms of just having enough nuclear weapons to prevent war, Russia and China have both been developing nuclear weapons that you would expect for war fighting. And again, people didn't want to acknowledge this. They didn't want to recognize this. I mean, why would Russia build a 500 kilometer range dual capable missile? What, what is that for? The Iskander built it back in 2008 and, and nobody really blinked, even though the only thing that's really good for is nuking soldiers really close to where it is or you know, possibly getting close to a city and nuking a city. Not really the thing that you would need for um, minimal credible, minimum credible deterrence. And even with and people wanted to believe that everything was fine up until the Federation of American Scientists broke the story of hundreds of new missile silos. We still don't know what that means in terms of exactly how many warheads China's building, but we see them building intercontinental range, sub-launch ballistic missiles, uh, dual capable cruise missiles and ballistic missiles of all kinds of ranges and Russia doing the same. And in the meantime, the US really trying to um, refurbish its existing arsenal, but not really thinking about 
dozens of different types of new weapons for new systems. Now in the Ukraine crisis, you know, it, this goes into the backdrop of Russia in 2018 announcing that it had these six new systems uh, in a big speech that Vladimir Putin gave on March 1, 2018, uh, specifically in order to be able to defeat missile defense and to defeat the United States. At the onset of the crisis, on the first day of the crisis, Putin threatened um, consequences beyond imagination if the West got involved. And then on the 27th of February, Putin gave a speech with Shoigu and uh, Grasimov in the room further threatening nuclear retaliation and actually saying that he was putting nuclear forces on a special alert. And for those of us in the nuclear field, the old Soviet doctrine was in order to launch nuclear weapons, the premier, the minister of defense, and the chief of the military all had to agree to launch. So this was kind of a, a signal to nuclear geeks that, that this was really significant. So in the Ukraine crisis, with Ukraine having given up its nuclear weapons um, as a part of joining the NPT treaty back in the 1990s and the normalization of their um, politics and entry into the global uh, diplomatic sphere, there's all these questions. Should Ukraine have given up nuclear weapons? What's the use of deterrence in this crisis? And it has set off a debate at NATO and globally about the value of nuclear weapons in terms of defense. Would Ukraine be attacked if it still had held on to those nuclear weapons? Personally, I think that's an empty debate. Ukraine would not have been able to enter the international system if it had retained its nuclear weapons. There were, that would be a very, very different world uh, with Ukraine, a nuclear armed Ukraine at the heart of Europe. Um, but there is this debate, should countries seek nuclear weapons? And I think this gets back to what Yoko was saying, that one of the reasons the US offers extended deterrence guarantees to the NATO alliance and to Japan and to South Korea, and has this, these nuclear relationships with different countries like Australia, um, is because the US doesn't want these countries to have to rely on their own nuclear weapons. So the US has extensive uh, arrangements at NATO, specifically because back in the 1960s, the number of countries in Europe that were seeking nuclear weapons was very high. There was a secret agreement between West Germany, France, and Italy, for instance, that we found out about, where they were promising to share nuclear weapons technology. Even in this crisis, you mentioned before that Japan, there's a debate on nuclear weapons. We've seen that debate actually in Germany. Should Germany develop its own nuclear weapons? I mean, this is just, this is terrible. And this is why the United States is trying to um, increase the confidence of allies in US extended deterrence. The extended deterrent guarantee, NATO's nuclear sharing arrangements, all these promises that US made is to try to stop countries from seeking nuclear weapons. And so in that regard, it's, it, it's very much along the lines of the NPT. It's very much along the lines of trying to limit uh, uh, the nuclear spread. But there are countries who are really seriously considering this. Can Japan rely on the United States and therefore do they need their own? The debate's even more extensive in South Korea, as we've heard, about you know, asking for US forward basing or developing their own. And this will continue until the US is able to really um, develop better nuclear dialogue with its partners and convince them not to seek nuclear weapons. And then the Middle East, I mean, there may be a proliferation cascade there uh, with Iran and Saudi Arabia and other countries in that region seeking nuclear weapons as well. So yes, back on the agenda and time to really think again about how we arrange ourselves in order to prevent countries from seeking nuclear weapons. Yeah. And um you know the scenario that you're painting is is alarming enough in itself because it sounds like we are potentially very clearly on the brink of a whole new range of nuclear proliferation but there's an even more alarming uh scenario that people are talking about which is that this conflict itself could lead to the mm -hmm. first use of nuclear weapons since 1945 uh you know people are openly talking about it lavrov talked about it earlier this week um you know, what's your assessment of, of the likelihood of that, to, to, to be frank? Quite frankly, I think it's very low. I think Russia is using nuclear coercion to attempt to achieve outcomes. Uh, so it wants to threaten, if NATO gets involved, nuclear threat. And actually, through the conflict, we've seen these threats kind of evolve. You know, maybe sanctions is too far. Maybe providing heavy equipment is too far. And that just goes to show you that what Russia is trying to do is they're trying to achieve political aims, trying to limit cooperation with Ukraine through the use of nuclear threats. If you actually think about the use scenarios, Gideon, I mean, as you point out, the first nuclear use in a wartime situation since 1945, what would happen to Russia in terms of the international system the next day? Would India be happy to continue trading with a country that had just launched a nuclear weapon at Ukraine or in its crisis? I don't think so. I think even China would say this is a little bit 
unacceptable. Mm. Um, you know, we've got a huge movement, G77 nations and other countries that are actually impatient with the, the pace of disarmament. So I think Russia knows that crossing that line, you know, uh, regime change is not the aim of the West right now, uh, despite some some statements to the contrary. If Russia uses nuclear weapons in this conflict, I think that's one guaranteed way to make sure that that is the center of the debate going forward, that Putin is not a le world leader that we can deal with. And I think Russia would face the kind of isolation that makes Pyongyang look like Paris if they were to use nuclear weapons in this conflict. I really do. I think it would be a level of isolation that we've never seen a country subject to. And there would be broad agreement around the world that that was a bridge too far. What about this idea that, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier that, you know, they developed the Iskanders in 2008. Yeah. Um, and they have, as I understand it from a non-expert point of view, incorporated them into their yeah. military doctrine, escalate to de-escalate and all of that. So does that mean that they have developed an entire military doctrine that is totally unrealistic and they're never going to do it? I believe they have a nuclear war fighting doctrine that says that, you know, in the event of a war with NATO, that they would use nuclear weapons in, in the battlefield, in the theater, as well as globally. I think I think they think about these as war fighting tools. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's obvious because they're building weapons that are specifically built that way. And then they're exercising these in the big exercises like Zabhad. Um, so, I mean, we, we see them building the systems and exercising the systems. The doctrine, I mean, the unclassified doctrine, frankly, I don't think matters at all. Mm -hmm. It's when the doctrine doesn't match the systems and the exercises, then you can say, okay, yeah, we, we see what's going on here. I do think any war fighting capability, your intention is to see if you can out escalate your enemy. You see if you can convince them that the pain that you can inflict on them is more than the gain that they can get from going higher. So I think the whole escalate to de-escalate argument is very stale. I mean, in any conflict, you want to show the enemy that you you have the the the, the resolve to win. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I mean, what's the alternative that you say, okay, if you escalate, then I quit? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, but but Related specifically to nuclear weapons, I do think Russia is building nuclear weapons for war fighting at the at the at the battlefield level and at the theater level. Okay, uh, let me bring you to uh, Yoko's specific proposals. So mm -hmm. you, you were saying before when we were just chatting uh, that you thought they were very innovative and interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what what is it you like about them? Well, on the on the global part, on the global double track proposal. So Yoko is is proposing um, that we try to talk about global disarmament. Uh, obviously, it has to be phrased the right way. It has to be thought about the, the right way. I think missile proliferation globally is a problem that is not sufficiently addressed with the tools that we have today. And I know that Russia, over the past 20 years, over the past 30 years, actually, has complained bitterly about the proliferation of missile systems to its potential adversaries. Um, and they've had a couple proposals on the, on the table before about uh, limiting missile proliferation. Surely at some point, China is going to look around at its own neighborhood and say, you know, is it ha look at South Korea. They're building an extraordinary arsenal of short and intermediate range missiles, uh, including 4,000 kilometer range uh, ground launched, uh, air launched, sea launched missiles. The only, well, the first country to have sub launched ballistic missiles that doesn't even have a nuclear weapons program. So I think there may be some trade space here. Mm -hmm. to, at least the West should say we should talk about global limitations on missiles. Um, I think going down the route of nuclear armed versus conventional armed is wrong because, as we've seen in the Ukraine crisis, all these missiles that can deliver nuclear weapons are being used in the conventional mode as well, like Caliber and Iskander being launched all the time in the Ukraine crisis. So the ability to confirm nuclear versus conventional with a very large number of missiles is going to be difficult. I think instead you really have to look at limiting capping, limiting, and potentially rolling back um, uh, missile types and, and numbers. And so having a global proposal for that, to open up a global dialogue, to have a UN government group of experts look at missiles again, which we haven't done in a long time, and to look at what is the missile technology control regime sufficient? Is the Hague Code of Conduct sufficient? I mean, Hague Code of Conduct has not succeeded on its face. So are there ways to think of new ways of approaching? And I think that's the global part. On the other part, on a NATO uh, Asian uh, dialogue, so the US has developed since the Obama administration much deeper nuclear consultations with Japan. 
and South Korea to help expand their knowledge of how nuclear weapons would be used. And there's a number of different bodies that have existed with South Korea and Japan for decades, but really a lot of energy has gone into this since 2008, 2009. And I think that needs to be continued and expanded. The question is whether the United States would be willing to bring that into a NATO context. There's certainly a NATO appetite to talk more to the global partners. And we've seen Japan and South Korea and Australia engaged heavily at NATO uh, over the past five, six, seven years. I mean, starting with the, the out of area operations, but now increasingly on the situation in Ukraine and the situation in Europe. So I think that's a very good thing. And if we could institutionalize that, as uh, Yoko pointed out back in, um, right after the end of, the, as the Cold War was ending and as the Soviet Union collapsed, we created the North Atlantic Cooperation Council to bring in more heads of state to have dialogue with NATO at the highest level. And at first that was the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union actually broke up during one of those meetings and the delegate had to go out and come back as the Russian delegate. Uh, and then all the, the, the former republics came in to, to the NACC for dialogue. Now this would be even different. This would be even better. This would be you know, a dialogue among at, uh, NATO's you know, highest capability, um, most common interest partners. So South Korea, Japan, Australia, you know, and you could think about other members potentially as well. Uh, and we see informal groupings like this, just like the meeting at Rammstein Air Force Base, where the U.S. brought in uh, countries from Africa, countries from the Middle East, countries from East Asia. We see these configurations appearing. So is there a possibility for an actual institution that NATO could build for regular consultations? Because I know for the partner countries like Japan and South Korea and Australia, there's a little bit of impatience sometimes. They don't always get invited. And there's always a question as to when they'll get invited and under what format. If you had an actual existing format that any of the parties could call for a meeting, that, that might be really, that, I think that's a great idea. Mm. Okay, um, I can see encouragingly lots of questions already coming in on the chat, and I'll come to them in about uh, 10 minutes or so. But uh, just before I do that, if I take a step back, I mean, it strikes me that uh, the second bit of Yoko's proposal um, is, uh, you know, obviously about Asian Western cooperation. Um, and I, I'd be interested, to, I'll start with you, Yoko. Um, how far do people in Japan and in the broader region see their particular security dilemmas as in any way changed or connected to what's happening in Russia, Ukraine, or do they see it as almost a distraction? You know, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, you know, this is a bit worrying if you're in Asia because American and European attention is going to be drawn away uh, to this other crisis. So what, what are the connections and how, how are people thinking that through? Um, well, I think at the initial stage of this war, there were responses like this is a, this is going to be a distraction that Americans are going to pull away their resources and turn back to Europe. You know, this eternal pivoting <laughs> doesn't yeah. really help. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, um, I, I don't really buy this pivoting because that that you know that means you you're going away from somewhere to get somewhere. Um, so I'm I'm saying we need to really combine these uh, all the elements we have. But uh, about the Ukraine war, I think um, com comparing to the, the the Crimean crisis 2014, the difference is striking. I mean, at that time, people were not interested at all. Uh, you you know, you, the the people on the street hardly knew anything about what was going on there and the consequences. Now, I mean, every day uh, the top news is is Ukraine, uh, basically, and you have TV um, personality shows, and you know, wherever, whenever at, um, you turn on the TV, and there's always several channels doing Ukraine, covering Ukraine. Of course, not in a very intelligent or strategic way, but they are definitely interested in what is, what is happening there, and they feel that their world is somehow at stake there and they feel very much for the destructions and the sufferings of the Ukrainian people. It's so that's really interesting huge... because, sorry hmm. to interrupt, but you know, when I speak, say, to uh, people in India or South Africa, hmm. even there's not that same sense, you know, on the contrary, hmm. there, there's hmm. a sort of pushback against the West and saying, hmm. well, you know, there's a lot of suffering around the world, there's problems in Tigray or Yemen or whatever. Why are you mm. so particularly upset about this? And incidentally, maybe Russia has a point. 
that is the mm. sort of global south reaction simplifying massively yeah, yeah but that's yeah, not so I, the debate in japan no, it's not it's very interesting that uh, that japan has reacted in such a way because i i miss south korean reaction actually yeah. um you, you look at the audience list today uh, and we actually miss south korea i i i, I tried in the last minute to to get some of my friends to come and sit, but not very successfully. Um, I'm not really sure. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, do you have an explanation? On the other hand, you see a long list of Japanese participants, and that really shows how interested they are. Um, I don't know the statistics, but I'm, I, I'm sure that the Dawa Foundation doesn't always get that number of uh, participants from Tokyo sitting in at this time of the <laughs> of the day. Yeah. Um, so they are interested. I think the leadership uh, played a role. Um, that uh, this was a different government from the government we had uh, uh, in last several years. Um, and then I think um, about what William just said, yeah. the dialogues that have been going on between Japan and US in bilateral um, settings. Now, I sat down with three consecutive chiefs of staff of the Japanese Self-Defense Force uh, several weeks ago uh, for, a, for, a, for a journal interview, which is coming out uh, in a couple of days, I think. And all three of them were quite unhappy with the, the, <laughs> the dialogue. <laughs> okay, so they were the ones sitting there, I, I guess. <laughs> no. and, and one of them is actually strongly propagating nuclear sharing precisely because he wants more information. So that, you know, um, they're not satisfied. Um, I, 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 I'm not the one sitting there, so I don't know what's going on. But I can tell you they're not happy with what they have heard. So I'm not sure the Germans are happy, <laughs> but anyway, if they know that what's going on on the other side, maybe, you know, they would feel differently uh, because they're sort of, you know, far away, isolated and not, don't know uh, what's going on on the other side of the world. They imagine that things must be much rosier in, in NATO where they have this uh, um, beautiful thing called NATO sharing and once you're in it you get all the information you want and you get the, to decide together whereas they feel they're kind of only given a fraction of information and not really given the the, the, the decision-making power or any say in the in the use of nuclear weapons which they see as uh, having much more chance of being used Right. Whether that's right or not, it's a different thing. And you just said you don't think so. But there's a heightened perception that that might happen. Mm. And then what? Yeah. Um, my personal take is that I don't know what Putin thinks. Nobody knows. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, if he was a, a rational um, thinking person, he would not have invaded Ukraine in the first place at all. So I don't. I, I will not. Yeah, I mean, I, I must say, it was it was William who said that he thought, and I was relieved to hear him say that he thought of minimal <laughs> yeah, chance. but sure. But you know, I've been speaking to other people, you know, in this world. Graham Allison, for example, mm -hmm. who's on my podcast tomorrow, uh, who takes it mm -hmm. very seriously and thinks there's quite a strong chance. Yeah. I mean, well, I just hope well, he's he has wrong. He's been very serious for a long time. <laughs> I know yeah, that. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, yeah. Um, I don't know what Putin thinks, so I hope he doesn't. But he may. Yeah. But in the event he does. I think it's still important that we don't, we, we meaning the Western and NATO and, and US, doesn't immediately jump to nuclear reaction to a nuclear, a limited nuclear use. There are yeah. different ways that we can respond and it doesn't have to be nuclear. Uh, but is, which... isn't it interesting though, I'll let, and I'll bring in the audience in a second, that we really don't know how we would respond. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, may, maybe there is a secret <laughs> plan in the desk drawer and somebody's like, oh, he uses a tactical nuclear weapon, we do that. But that's not my impression. Mm -hmm. I think that mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. we'd be in shock uh, and we wouldn't really mm -hmm. know exactly how to respond mm -hmm. and that one of the options on the table certainly mm -hmm. would be to respond with a nuclear weapon, yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, no, I hope not. But I hope, uh, I mean, yesterday the, the gentlemen were sitting down at Rammstein and I hope they talked about uh, various options. Um, but yeah. again, going back to what, what William said about Russia preparing to preparing nuclear weapons that are obviously not very useful, 
but NATO has a very long history of having thousands of nuclear weapons that are not very useful, okay? And I don't want Asia to go back to that. And that's why I'm kind of being so vocal recently, um, despite my, my natural tendencies. <laughs> So thank you both very much for, for joining us. It's, and thanks to the Daiwa Foundation, to, uh, to Jason, to, to Nana for, for setting it all up. Um, thanks for the audience, uh, you know, uh, all over the world, a lot in Tokyo, but a lot in, a lot in Europe and the US for, for joining us. Um, and to all the questions that came in, uh, I'm ap apologies, I couldn't get to get to you all, but uh, it was it's great to see such active participation. Um, but above all, thank you to Yoko and to William for a great discussion. I'm sure we'll have further discussions in future, but for now from this uh, Daiwa Foundation Forum, that's it. Thank you all very much.